Now, in verse 1, and I'm reading now, "...for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him." Now, this is very important for us to see, and I want to note first the little word for. Now, that little word is cement. It holds what's been said with what's going to come for this Melchizedek. And it takes us back to the 20th verse. And actually, we need really to move back to verse 17. And that's Hebrews 6. And I'm going over that now rapidly. I'm reading verse 17 of chapter 6. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Now, when God does a thing like this, and he doesn't need to take an oath, but he does, he makes it very clear that this is important. This is all important. And he'd have you and me know that it is all important. And he says here that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, we call attention here to these two immutable things, the death and resurrection of Christ, and then his ascension and intercession for us today. These are four great facts that give us an assurance, and it has given us a refuge that we can lay hold of. Now, the minute he mentions that, it calls to mind the reference back in, well, it's in the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy. In fact, if you want the reference back in chapter 35 of Numbers and Deuteronomy 19 and the 20th and 21st chapters of Joshua, there were cities of refuge. And those cities of refuge are types of Christ, uh, sheltering the sinner from death. And it's a very marvelous thing that they did. You see, one could flee to one of these cities if he had accidentally killed someone. And maybe the one he killed has a hot-headed brother, and he's going to get vengeance. Well, this party can flee to a city of refuge. Then he can be tried by his peers, his elders. And if he is declared free, then he's acquitted, and he can leave the protection of the city of refuge now. That is, after the death of the high priest that was high priest when it happened, and a new high priest comes along. And boy, what a picture this is for us. This reveals that Christ is our refuge today. I have already been carried into court, into God's court. And may I say the trial was a trial that found me guilty. I was a sinner, and the penalty that was leveled against me was death. And by the way, it's already been executed. Christ bore that for me, you see. He died. Now I'm free, as this man now can leave the city of refuge. I'm free. I'm delivered. I'm delivered from the penalty of sin. Never have to answer for it again. I'm free now to go out and serve him. And now I actually have a new high priest that I can go to, the resurrected Christ now. And I can go to him. You see what we've gotten into now? We've gotten into what's known as types. And a great many people don't like types. That's the thing you see that's the beefsteak. Babes like milk. They like these nice little sermonettes on the 23rd Psalm and about the Sermon on the Mount, and you must be a nice little boy, and you must be good. And if you do all those things, and you're, you know, a sort of a decent citizen that doesn't get in trouble or get too many traffic tickets, then you're one that's a candidate for salvation. In fact, God's going to pat you on the back, and you're going to be like that little, was it little Tommy Tucker called for his supper? But somebody else has sat in the corner, little Jack Horner. He sat in the corner. That is it. And he was eating a piece of pie. He reached in his thumb. He pulled out a plum and he said, what a smart boy am I. 
We got our churches filled with little Jack Horner reaching into the pie, and they're saying they're a smart boy. My friend, may I say to you, that's baby stuff. That's a nice glass of milk for you. But how about trying a porterhouse steak now? And you need the protein, by the way, if you're going to grow and grace and reach maturation now. And we're going to deal with the type. This is a picture of my Savior. This is a picture book. And now this is something I'm to look upon. Somebody says, but is that scriptural? Will you listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 11? He says, all these things happened unto them for examples. The word in the Greek is types, literally. It's types. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the end or the consummation of the ages has come. Those things have been written, just certain things, and there were millions of things that could have been recorded in the past. But God did not record those things. He recorded these things because these are the things that can enable you to grow and a knowledge of the Word of God. And therefore, this is a wonderful type. This is a wonderful picture. Now, he goes on to say in verse 19, "...which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil." whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we have a high priest. He's gone within the veil, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, the difference between Aaron and the Lord Jesus Christ is this, and I say this reverently, poor old Aaron never did sit down. When he's serving, There was no seats in the tabernacle. There was a mercy seat, but God was there. And Aaron, he hurried in, hurried out. He didn't spend time there. But you and I have got a superior high priest. He's gone in. He sat down. He has a finished redemption. He's presented his blood there. And today there's a mercy seat, and he's our intercessor there. Now we're talking about beefsteaks, friends. We're not talking about drinking a little milk now, arguing about some little doctrine today and about whether I do this or do that. We're talking now about our great high priest. I'm reading again. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now, there's something else here. The critic today does not like dispensations. He says, my, he's against that. The denomination that I was brought up in has made that a heresy today, this matter of dispensation. And many preachers won't mention it. I mention it because the Bible even uses the term. And these are the different ages you see. Now, you need to look over this. Back in the Old Testament, you had Aaron as the high priest, and you had a literal tabernacle down here. We today have a literal high priest, and he's not ministering in any building down here. He's up yonder at God's right hand, and he's there right now. What kind of faith do you have today, friends? Have you been growing in grace? Has Jesus Christ at God's right hand become a reality to you today? We're talking now about a steakhouse. I want to take you to dinner. <laughs> And a great many people say, I eat dinner with you. All right, let's have steak today. I know meat's always very high, isn't it? Very expensive. God furnishes this for us, and he says it's without money and it's without price. Now we have here then this very wonderful picture of Melchizedek. Now, actually, we have a reference to him back yonder in the Old Testament. And It's just one reference back there in the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis. And frankly, I would have forgotten about him, but the Spirit of God didn't forget about him. And now we come to the 110th Psalm, and there's a prophecy about him, that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he's coming. Now he's come. 
And you and I are living in the day of his priesthood. So here in Hebrews, we have quite a few references to him. Someone, I think, has said there are ten references to him. Here are nine or ten verses. And, for instance, go back to chapter 5, just for a minute now, verses 5 and 6. So Christ also glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that spake unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then again in the 10th verse, He's named of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And I come over to chapter 6 and verse 20, whether as a forerunner, Jesus entered for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And now we have this statement here in chapter 7, and he's really going to talk about him now. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Now, I, I really think that the very key of chapter 7, you'd have to go down in the chapter to verse 17. And there we'd read this, For he testifieth, or he witnesses, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're going to look at Christ as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that means that we need to know all we can know about Melchizedek. We've talked about him before. Now, we see here several things about him. In the first three verses, Christ is a perpetual priest because he's after Melchizedek. And then in verses 4 to 22, Christ is a perfect priest. And then you come down to verses 23 to 28. Christ in his person is perpetual, a perpetual and perfect priest. So that now we are looking at the priesthood of Christ, and that's the work of Christ I find greatly neglected today in the church. Now let's go back to chapter 14 of Genesis. And I want to turn back to that chapter and look at it because we have a lot said here. Well, we have a lot said about Lot, if you want to play on words. You understand that Lot had moved down to Sodom. And then we have a record in Genesis 14. This is a remarkable chapter, by the way, in many ways. It records the first war. And here you have the kings of the east. They formed a confederacy, and they came together against the kings of the west, that is, those that were around the Dead Sea. And those that came from the east, well, they won. And they were lugging off the people as slaves and the wealth of the city as booty. And word was brought to Abram that his nephew Lot was being carried away into captivity. And so Abraham did a rather unusual thing. He was able to arm about 318. That means he had quite a household. And that means with each man that he could arm must have been one woman and a child at least. That would mean that he had about a thousand that served and under him. So he takes these 318, and by a surprise attack, he was able to get a victory over the kings of the east. And all he was concerned about was just rescuing Lot. But in so doing, he was able to rescue the king of Sodom and all the Sodomites. That was nothing to brag about. 